travel continues to change, and it's safe to say that traveling today is different than it was, I don't know, 20-ish years ago. But think about the changes that have happened in travel in the last 287 years. It was 287 years ago that John Wesley got on a boat to make the trip from Europe to the New World. He was on his way to Georgia. He had something on his heart and on his mind. He wanted to come and teach and preach to people who found themselves on this side of the globe. Now, getting on a boat and traveling that far is not on the top of my list of things to do. Even under today's circumstances of a plush cruise liner, I'm not super pumped. I definitely would not be for getting on a boat 287 years ago and crossing the ocean. And guess what? John Wesley really wasn't either. In fact, it's been said that John Wesley was terrified of water. Can you imagine? For days, for weeks, they made the trip from one shoreline to the other. And along the way, they encountered storm after storm. And storm number one was bad, but not too bad. Storm number two was a little worse, but not over the top. But then storm number three. Now, this is the one where for John Wesley, things begin to unravel. Because the water begins to spill up over the sides of the boat. The main sail on the boat splits. And John Wesley pastor and theologian, has his following with him from England, and they are terrified. And yet something catches his attention, because he looks and he sees another group of people who are not so afraid. This is a group of German Christians that are known as Moravians. They're followers of Jesus that are coming from a different place, and their style and their understanding of worship is just a little bit different. And John Wesley is struck at how calm, cool, and collected they are. Because as the water splashes over the sides of the ship, these German Christians continue to sing and to pray and to read scripture. And when they reached dry land, John Wesley asked them, he said, were you not afraid? Your women and children, were you not afraid? And they said, no, we have nothing to be afraid of. And John Wesley, in that moment, experienced something that would change his life. He saw a faith in action that he had never seen before. He saw people faithfully following Jesus in such a way that he was so impacted That he would go and seek them out when he returned to Europe to spend time among them, to learn from them, and to pray with them, and to worship with them. And John Wesley, always the journaler, wrote these words about that day. He said, this was the most glorious day which I have hitherto seen. And the day wasn't glorious because they had made landfall, because they hadn't yet. And the day wasn't glorious because he had reached his destination because he hadn't yet. And the day wasn't glorious because he was fulfilling this calling he had to preach the gospel in the new world because he hadn't yet. This day was glorious because of the faith that he saw in the lives of those Christians. And the two years that would follow would be absolutely incredible. Fruitful ministry would happen. The gospel would be preached. There would be incredible stories that would be told. But nothing would impact John Wesley in the same way as having a new and fresh vision for what it could look like to live for Jesus into the future. This morning, I want to tell you about a moment in my life that was similar to that. A moment where you see something and it changes the way that you approach the rest of your life. If we've never met before, my name's Ryan. I'm one of the pastors. I heard earlier that it said Chris was co-pastor on the side screens. If that's true, no one's told me yet. And so I assume I am still co-pastor with Pastor Jim. That is sort of the plan for right now. And today we have a special message for you. If you're new or newish to the summit, you may not know this, but we're beginning 
the process, we're in the middle of the process of having conversations about disaffiliating from the United Methodist denomination. In fact, next week is the vote. And we haven't spent a ton of time talking about the details, the logistics in our worship services. And there's lots of information online. I'll just tell you, if you want to hear the whys, uh, you can go to the summit.church slash forward. If you want to hear the hows, you can go to the summit.church slash vote on that site. There's even a ballot that you can look at to see what we're voting on next weekend. But today, I want to think about how we make a decision like this one. A monumental decision that can change the way that we live our lives. You know, I think when you're facing a decision, there are kind of three things that you may be tempted to do. The first one is to just instantly choose the familiar. To instantly choose the status quo. I just want to say yes to whatever is happening right now. So recently, my wife and I discovered that there's an ingredient that we use to make spaghetti at home that is no longer available. Now, what you need to know is that I'm a person who likes new and adventure and change, and Rebecca is not. And so while I thought, no worries, we'll find something different and we'll make this work, her initial reaction is, we're never eating spaghetti again. Because I can't have it the way that I've always had it, and I like the thing that I've always had in the past. And it's so funny, and it's so frustrating, and it's so incredibly true. See, sometimes when we're faced with a decision to make, we just choose what we've always had. Now, the second option, I live with teenagers, I experience this on a regular basis too, is to impulsively decide what you're going to do. If you've ever had teenagers, you probably know how that works. In fact, some of you may live with someone who makes decisions like that. And ultimately, that decision is made based on what sounds best right now. Not worried about all the future implications, don't want to run the data, don't care about how it may work out. But right now, this sounds good, looks good, will be good, we're doing this right now. And that's a way to make decisions. And sometimes there's a place for that, right? But there's also this third way, and this third way, I think, is the way that informs us best when there's a big decision on the horizon, and that is to thoughtfully, prayerfully weigh the options and the outcomes, and then to act in faith. Because ultimately, regardless of what decision we're going to make, the outcome is going to be unknown. And so how do we make a decision when we don't know what's on the other side? It's really simple. We choose to live with faith. And so today I want to pull this thread through for you. And the reality for us is this. Choosing faith today affects every tomorrow. And if you're here today and you're like, I'm not sure about the church thing, I'm not sure about the God thing, and I'm not sure about the faith thing, I just want to encourage you to listen in today. This message may not be something you go home and you think, okay, I'm going to start living this out, and that's fine. But maybe today you'll be compelled to think differently about how you approach things regarding faith. Because faith can make a difference in every area of our lives. See, I'm of of the opinion that everyone has reached a point in their life where you've had a decision to make and you haven't made it because you've not been sure about what's next. You haven't been certain about the outcome, and so you become paralyzed by fear, or you didn't take a chance because you weren't sure it was going to work out. And so today I want to look at this thread of faith that we can pull through to think about how we can see the faith of God's people throughout generations and the impact it can make for us even today. Today we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. If you have your Bible, you can get it out, you can turn there, you can Google it. The book of Hebrews was likely written by a male and likely written by someone who is of the Jewish faith. We don't know exactly, but that's kind of the understanding we have about why we're reading this and what is written. And today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, which is often called the chapter about faith. It's called the Hall of Faith. And so the words that we're going to read, the stories we're going to look at from the beginning of the Old Testament to the, old, the, the end of the Old Testament are going to be stories to be familiar to these people. 
they wouldn't hear the, the name Noah and be like, now who is that again? I can't quite. No, no, no. They're going to know everything there is to know about Noah. But their perspective is being challenged and changed because of who Jesus is and because of what faith can mean for us. So here we go. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. It's seeing a vision of what could be and having confidence that it can be fulfilled. And yet, since we do not know and we cannot see, it's having assurance that God will come alongside. See, today when we look at these stories, we're not talking about becoming like these people. We don't want to become like Noah. But we do want to have the faith that Noah had. So as we look at Hebrews chapter 11, I'm going to give you a quick survey. We see the story of Abel. Abel who brought his offering alongside Cain. And God was pleased with the offering of Abel. Why? Because he brought his best offering. And by faith he brought his best offering to God. We also see the story of Noah. By faith Noah was obedient to God. And God counted it to him as scripture said as righteousness. Abraham, by faith, picked up and moved to a foreign land where everything and everyone was unknown and lived in that place and began a new reality for his family. And Sarah, his wife, by faith became the mother of nations. When we have faith, an incredible reality begins to unfold. But there's something we need to know about living with faith. Faith is not a guarantee that everything is going to go well and everything is going to go right and that everything is going to satisfy your every desire. In fact, in Hebrews 11:13, he writes this, all these people were still living by faith when they died. What does that mean? They're still living by faith because they had not seen the outcome. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. And you get that concept. You know that, right? Because we talked about that a few weeks ago. That we are not made for this place. We are aliens, strangers on this world. We are citizens of heaven. We are made for something different. And that's not just true today. That has been true then as well. And though they lived faithfully, they didn't experience the fulfillment of their faith because living with faith is not about what we receive. It's about embracing a vision of something that's greater than what we currently have. He continues, verse 15. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Going somewhere new. Experiencing something different. Choosing something exciting requires a step of faith. And to be sure, sometimes it's more than a step. It's a leap. But here's what we know. Choosing faith today affects every tomorrow. Let's see how this unfolds in the rest of Hebrews chapter 11. It's a chain reaction that begins to happen. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was young, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of the staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. This is a chain reaction from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph. And it continues by faith. Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. Our students that Chris showed us a few minutes ago are learning this story this weekend, by the way. 
By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Do you see what's happening here? Do you see what is unfolding here? Faith begets faith. And generations impact generations. I shared just briefly last week about this incredible thing that's happening at Asbury University. Last week I said, you know, it's a chapel service that's been going on for four or five days. And so today I'm telling you it's a chapel service that's been going on for 11 or 12 days. They met together and the the Holy Spirit began to move and there was an outpouring that happened. And there has been 24-7 prayer and worship happening on that campus since that moment. I think I have a photo of what's happening in the room. It's absolutely incredible. Last weekend, instead of watching the Super Bowl, students were worshiping. This week, instead of spending time after class, hanging out and doing whatever, they're doing their homework and they're going back to worship. In fact, it's, that's the view inside, but the view outside is maybe even more incredible. The line is extending for a half mile, a mile of people waiting to get in. Asbury Seminary, which is nearby, recently posted four or five buildings on their campus that they're saying are now open for people to come and experience the presence of God in that place. You know what's most amazing? This is young people experiencing the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's something that could happen just as well in every church across our country this morning. These students will never be the same because of what they've experienced, because of the power of God. Generations impact generations. And what strikes me as I think about 18-year-olds who I now view as children making these kinds of decisions is that the older I get, the fewer opportunities I will have to make those kinds of life-altering, generation-changing decisions. And so when I do, what do I do? That's when I need to jump in and act. See, and here's the thing. We're not talking about a blind faith. We're not talking about these students worshiping for no apparent reason. They worship with Hebrews chapter 11 in mind, with God's faithfulness being alive and well throughout the generations. In fact, I I remember uh, Hebrews 11, starting in verse 32. He writes, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, and shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. How Incredible. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went out in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes and in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, and yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. What does it look like to live with this kind of faith? It's to live knowing that we may never see the fruit of our actions. Last weekend, I watched a football game. There was only one football game on, so you can probably guess which football game it was, right? And I'm guessing that some of you saw this moment. And it's been seven days, I know, but this is not one that's forgettable, is it? Because in this moment, Jarek McKinnon made a decision. He was out in the open, running free. And I, th- I assume the Eagles wanted him to score. They weren't trying to tackle him super hard. But Jarek McKinnon made this incredible decision. He slid to a stop 
at the one yard line. Why? It wasn't because he didn't want to be able to say forever that he scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl. It wasn't because he didn't want to have his name etched in history. It wasn't just because they told him not to score a touchdown. He did it because he knew what was going to happen on the other side. He had faith. Why did he have faith? It wasn't blind faith. It was because the week before he had seen this. When Harrison Butker trotted out and kicked the game-winning field goal. Jarek McKinnon was informed by the past. He knew what could be. And that's what it's like to live with faith. As we look back, we see that he had faith and she had faith and they had faith. And in this moment, the invitation is that you might have faith. There was a time when I actually wondered if I could have that kind of faith. I had been a pastor for several years when Rebecca and I got married. And when we got married, we sort of had this um, ongoing cycle of hard things happen. It wasn't too long after we got back from our honeymoon that her mom let us know that her cancer had returned and she would be undergoing new cancer treatments. And while that battle raged, her aunt and uncle were killed in a plane crash with her baby cousin. Soon thereafter, her grandparents began passing away, kind of in a one-by-one sort of fashion. In 2006, Rebecca's mom went home to be with Jesus. The first few years of our marriage were bumpy. But nothing could prepare us for what we would face in 2009. The beginning of 2009 was wonderful. Uh, We found out that we were pregnant with Camden. We were super excited. We had one happy, healthy, perfect little baby, and we thought, Wouldn't it be great to add another happy, healthy, perfect little baby to the Shrek and Gast family? Because that's always how it goes, right? And then on May 7th, we lost our dog, Dakota. She was young. It was a medical thing. And if if you're not sad about that, you're a cat person and it's okay. But if you're a dog person and you lose your dog, that's, that's a significant loss in your life. On May 28th, my grandma went home to be with Jesus. On August 1st, just a few weeks later, my grandpa joined her. And on August 16th, Camden was born. Now, if you know anything about having a baby, you know that's an exciting time. But you take the excitement and you add on all of the unknown and all of the new and difficult things that come with having a baby that has medical issues, and you understand the challenges. Overnight, we went from being a two-income family to a one-income family trying to figure out how we were going to make it. I worked at a church at the time, and you've heard me tell this story before. The support that my church offered me was a phone call asking me when I would be returning to work. Quite literally, our world was unraveling. But in the midst of all of that, something happened. We were preparing for an event for our students, for student ministry. And the event was called Kaleo because we used Greek words to that our students know how smart we were or something. I don't know. But the event was called Kaleo. And we were going to train and equip them to find a place to serve in the life of the church. And part of the thing we were doing was taking a spiritual gifts inventory. And I learned early on that you don't give someone something to do without doing it yourself. And so I took the spiritual gifts inventory. Now keep in mind, I'm a 31-year-old guy at this point, right? I know myself. I know everything there is to know about myself. So I could go ahead and jot down all of the spiritual gifts before I even took the inventory. And so I did, and then I took the inventory, and I was shocked that there was a discrepancy. What the inventory told me were my spiritual gifts were not exactly the same as what I thought my spiritual gifts were. I mean, administration and leadership and preaching and uh, vision, those are kind of my spiritual gifts. And as I took the inventory and I looked at the results and I double-checked them because I was sure that they were wrong, I found that my number one top spiritual gift was the gift of faith. And I had no idea how much I would need the gift of faith. Not just in the coming weeks and the coming years, but for the rest of my life. John Wesley defines faith as an extraordinary trust in God under the most difficult or dangerous circumstances. I needed that. I need that. We need that. In such a time as this, 
when we look out at what is to come for us as a church, we see that there is some unknown. And the question is, what is on the other side? If we vote to stay, we don't know what that means. If we vote to go, we have a better idea, but there are some unknowns. And the question for us is, how will we respond? And I love what the writer of Hebrews says to wrap all of this up. It's actually in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these people who live by faith, who have seen the faithfulness of God, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And what do we do? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The faith of John Wesley was solidified on that boat 278 years ago. And my hope, my prayer, is that we as a church will have one of those moments next week as we come together to vote on the future of our church. In that moment, you can demonstrate your faith. But the great news is, you don't have to wait till then. You can do it even in this moment today. And what you do today matters as well because you know this now. Choosing faith today affects every tomorrow. Will you pray with me?